Another very high profile researcher has been accused of data fraud, but this time it's not just any researcher. It is the president of Stanford University, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. His name is Mark Tessier Lavigne, and a few days ago he announced that he is stepping down as president of Stanford University due to these allegations that I'm going to tell you about in today's video. So in this video I'm going to tell you what those allegations are and more interestingly I think is how those allegations had to come to light. Then I'll tell you what Stanford's response was to these allegations and then I'm going to conclude on what this tells us about the state of academia especially at the top level. This story is even more depressing than the Francesca Gino case we talked about a few weeks ago, and the outcome of the investigation I think is an irreparable stain on Stanford's reputation. So buckle up, this story is sad, shocking, and depressing, but let's jump into it. So Mark Tessier Lavigne is a neuroscientist. That means he studies nerve cells and brain tissue and neurobiology. He's most famous for his supposedly groundbreaking research in the 90s and early 2000s that discovered how the brain develops, how neurons develop, which apparently has big implications for Alzheimer's disease. So through this groundbreaking research into neuroscience, apparently a whole subfield of neuroscience study was developed. And through many years, many promotions being put in charge of many different research labs, he's managed to work his way all the way up the academic ladder to being in one of the most prestigious positions in all of academia, president of Stanford University. And in addition to being president of the university, he's also on the board of directors for several neuroscience-based medical research companies. He's become a very influential person, not only in the world of neuroscience, but in academia in general. And so anybody who wants to stand up to him and call him out on his research would be taking a massive reputational risk to themselves as the backlash could be potentially fatal for their career. And it's probably for that reason that Marc Tessier Lavigne had not been investigated thoroughly for so many years, despite rumors of malpractice circulating in niche academic circles for a long time. That was until, and this is the craziest part of the whole story, these allegations were formally investigated by an 18-year-old freshman at Stanford University, Theo Baker. So Theo Baker has got to be the biggest badass of this whole story. Theo Baker is an 18-year-old freshman at Stanford University, and he's also part of the Stanford Daily newspaper, which is a student-run newspaper where all of the journalists are working for free, including Theo. So Theo Baker took it upon himself to go and reach out to somebody else called Elizabeth Bick. Now Elizabeth Bick is a biologist, but she's also a scientific fraud investigator, which made her a perfect person to investigate Mark Tessier's work for cases of fraud. So Theo Baker got in contact with her and she agreed to look into his work to see if there's any malpractice going on. And she sure as hell found some malpractice. So I'm going to explain Elizabeth Bick's findings to you now. Warning, things are going to get a little bit technical because this is neuroscience research, but I'm going to explain it in as simple a way as I possibly can. All of these allegations were originally reported on by Theo Baker in his original Stanford Daily article, which was published in November 2022. So if you want to read that article in full, I'll have a link to it in the description. But let's jump into the allegations. So many of the allegations of data fraud relate to these blots. And don't those blots look fishy to you? Just kidding. For 99.9% .9 of you watching this video, you have no idea what you're looking at, and that's not me disparaging you. When I saw these blots, I had no idea what I was looking at either. But I've spent every hour of my free time over the last three days to try and figure out what these blots actually mean. So here's what I found. So these blots are a result of a technique in biological science called Western blot. And it's a pretty complicated multi-step process, but you can kind of think of it as chromatography for proteins. So if I take you back to middle school chemistry class, chromatography is when you put a little blob of ink on a piece of paper, you dip the bottom of that paper in some shallow water, and as that water travels up the paper, the ink dissolves in the water, and the more soluble elements of that link travel further, and the less soluble ones get left further behind. And as a result, you get this beautiful pattern where all the different components of the ink are separated by solubility, which allows you to see what the different components of the ink actually are. In the case of Western blot, they're basically doing the same thing, but for proteins. So in the case of Marc Tessier Lavigne's research, he's taking a little bit of mouse neuron, maybe sliced up a little bit of brain or something, dissolved it in a solution, put it into one of these machines, 
And what happens is that as the solution trickles down the membrane of the machine, the heavier proteins get left at the top and the lighter proteins filter down to the bottom, which allows you to see all the different proteins that exist in that solution. And what Marc Tessier-Levine is testing for are specific proteins in this solution in order to prove his hypothesis. And at a very high level, the way that you read these blots is that the thicker and darker the blots are, the higher the concentration of the protein. And if there's no line at all, that means that that protein isn't present in your sample. So that is a very high level explanation for how Western blot works. If you want a more in-depth explanation, I highly recommend Emma Sandy's video, link in the description. She's a Scottish PhD student and she has the best video on how Western blot works that I could find on the internet. Thank you, Emma Sandy, for your amazing video. Anyway, back to the allegations. So these blots are supposed to represent the results of his manipulation, right? He's trying to show how FAC and PERC change the concentration of proteins in the mouse neuron. Don't ask me what FAC and PERC mean, I have absolutely no clue, but as you can see, the image, the results of his testing are exactly the same. And now you know that this is a kind of protein chromatography, it seems pretty unlikely that you would get exactly the same pattern of lines with two different manipulations. It's not just unlikely, in fact, it is impossible for that to be the case. So clearly, at the very least, there's been some false reporting here as to the results of their study. That could be an accident just when they were putting the paper together, but nevertheless, it's sloppy and should have been called out. So this blot manipulation was taken from a 2008 study from Marc Tessier-Lavigne, but there was other papers that involved blots as well, like for example, this 2001 paper, and this one, in my opinion, is even more egregious. So as you can see in this one, the way that the blots were published in the paper is kind of weird. They're like weirdly low resolution, it's a very blurry photo. And also, if you look carefully, you can see some odd artifacts in the imagery. There are some strange straight lines here and here. So Elizabeth Bick, who was approached by Theo Baker, took this image and all she did was simply turn up the contrast. And when you turn up the contrast, this is the result. Now with the contrast turned up, we can see very clearly what is actually going on. For example, these two yellow squares are exactly the same. And the green squares are also exactly the same, which suggests that somebody has gone into this photo and done a bit of Photoshop and is trying to hide something behind those squares. So that's where those weird, strange edges come from. And the most suspicious part to me is the fact that when they publish the paper, they deliberately have blurred the photo to try and make this manipulation of the photo less obvious. And they didn't declare it anywhere in the original paper. Now, Stanford University came forward and put out a statement saying that these mistakes do not affect the results or the interpretation of the results in the study. That's kind of not very reassuring to me as somebody who wants to trust in this kind of research, right? There's clearly been some effort here to manipulate the results, to mislead the people reading the paper. If it doesn't affect the results, that's fine, but it should be declared in the paper if that's the case. Why is there all this kind of suspicious behind the scenes manipulation trying to trick people into thinking that this is the original photo when it's clearly not? Not. not very convincing to me. A very similar situation with these ink blots as well. These are taken from the same 2001 paper. As you can see, the photo is very blurry. Elizabeth Bick turns up the contrast. This is the result. If you look at the top right, the blue rectangle on the left is the same as the blue rectangle on the right, except that the one on the right has been flipped upside down. And the red rectangles are literally exactly the same. So again, another clear example of image manipulation. And to me, and again, this wasn't called out in the original Stanford Daily article, but if you look at the top left panel, there's clearly some weird visual artifacts going on here as well. There seems to be some sort of pasted image here on the right. And same for the one in the bottom right as well. Like why is the texture weirdly blurry at the top here? Clearly looks like some sort of image manipulation. So not all of the allegations are related to inkblot. Some of them are just photos that he's manipulated. If you look at these results, this is from a 2003 paper from Marc Tessier-Lavigne. Each row is supposed to show a different brain, but as you can clearly see, the second and the third row are actually showing the exact same brain, just rotated. The parts of the photo in the red squares are literally exactly Exactly the same so clearly it's the same brain so again to me this manipulation is like really suspicious why are they rotating the photo is that to try and hide the fact that they've used the same photo twice it just seems really dodgy and it's definitely malpractice and this last one is probably the most comically obvious example of data fraud out of all of the allegations we've seen so far you don't need any training in neuroscience to see that this is clearly data fraud this is the original figure that was published in that 2001 paper the same one that some of those ink blots came from and what they're trying to say here is that after an hour, this neuron has grown. But if you just look at the little, you know, visual artifacts around the slide, you can clearly see that this is just the same photo zoomed in a bit. And the neuron hasn't grown at all, but guess what? When you zoom into things, they get larger. 
I mean, if you thought the Francesca Gino data fraud was basic, I mean, this is comically simplistic, right? You're literally playing spot the difference. I think a five-year-old could tell you that these two photos are actually the same. So that's just a sample of the allegations being brought against Mark Tessier Levine, and these were presented eight months ago by Theo Baker's article in November 2022. So what has happened in the eight months since? Well, since then, there's been an investigation into Mark Tessier Levine's work carried out by law firm Kirkland and Ellis. Gotta love Kirkland brand investigators, am I right? So in Kirkland and Ellis's investigation, there were a total of 12 papers that they were looking into that were deemed suspicious. Seven of them, Mark Tessier Levine was a co-author on the paper, but not the primary author. But for five of them, he was the primary author. And the conclusion to the report is perhaps the most baffling thing to me. In more legal language than this, they basically say that Mark Tessier Levine wasn't the one who did it. He wasn't aware of someone else in his lab doing it. It was some goon in his lab who did it without his knowledge. And the report even goes on to say that he wasn't being reckless in not checking the work before it was published. And I have no idea how you can possibly come to that conclusion when he's the primary author on this paper. If my name is going to be the primary author on this supposedly groundbreaking piece of neuroscience research, I'm going to be checking that paper multiple times before it goes to publication. And you're telling me that Mark Testi Levine didn't check through his own paper once, he didn't look at this diagram once and think that something looked fishy here? I mean, come on. That being said though, the report does go on to say that Tessia Levine's labs do seem to have an unusual frequency of manipulation of research data and or substandard scientific practices from different people at different times and in labs at different situations, which suggests that there may have been opportunities to improve laboratory oversight and management. And what that says to me is that Mark Tessier Levine is just totally corrupt. He basically has a long history of, at the very least, turning a blind eye to poor scientific practices in his lab across a long career, and he's continued to be happy to turn that blind eye as long as the checks keep rolling in. Speaking of checks, guess how much Mark Tessier Levine makes per year? According to research by the Stanford Daily, in 2021, he earned 1.5 million in his role for being president of Stanford and an additional $700,000 for being on the board of directors for Regeneron, one of his biotech medical research companies. 2.2 million per year. I take that, it's pretty good, doesn't hurt. So as you can see, turning a blind eye to poor research practices in your lab, pays pretty nice. But here's the part that pains me the most. So because the Kirkland and Ellis investigation concluded that he wasn't aware and didn't do the manipulation himself, he wasn't forced to resign by Stanford. Instead, he's voluntarily stepped down saying that the president of Stanford shouldn't have these kind of conversations around them. It's not good for the university. So he's stepping down as president, but he wasn't even fired by the board. Instead, he's going to continue being a faculty member of Stanford University and still continue to be allowed to run his labs. And I don't know how Stanford can hold their head up high as a legitimate scientific institution when they're letting somebody who has a clear track record of letting their labs have poor research practices continue to run a lab even after all of this comes to light. You're basically letting a guy who's proven to be corrupt continue to run corrupt labs and produce poor results. Like, it's absolutely baffling to me that this guy isn't fired. And not only is he allowed to continue running his lab, but as far as I can tell, he is still on the board of directors for Regeneron, making that very healthy $700,000 a year. So at the end of the Francesca Gino video I did last month, I had a sympathetic note for Francesca Gino, but absolutely no sympathy for you, Mark. You seem to be doing just fine despite all of these allegations. So what are my closing thoughts? In addition to all the points that we already made in the Francesca Gino video about the publish or perish culture that academia seems to breed, this also reveals something new, which is the fact that harder sciences are also just as open to fraud as the soft sciences, like behavioral science. That was one of the most common comments I got in the Francesca Gino video, people saying that this thing wouldn't happen in a hard science. This is neuroscience, medical science, and here we are looking at data fraud at a very high status level. Just because something has physical evidence doesn't mean that fraud isn't possible. It's certainly possible. And this should also silence any of the academics who were claiming that the Francesca Gino video was a win. Not only was Mark Tessier Levine not called out by the standard peer review process, but he had to be called out 20 years later by an 18 year old freshman at his local university newspaper. You know, full props to Theo for being extremely courageous and bringing this story forward, but it's absolutely ridiculous that he had to do that. Like this should have been caught years ago by the academic system and it simply wasn't. But what do you think of Mark Tessier Levine's story? Do you think my conclusions are fair or not? Let me know in the comments below. I promise you guys I'm gonna be making more uplifting videos in a few weeks. I already have done an interview with an amazing behavioral scientist who I think is doing incredible, robust, 
positive work that's helping the world. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe if you want to get that positive content. But for now, it's, it's just all scandal.